He did not stop creating. He did not stop being the creator. If you need a creative miracle, he's the creator. The narrow road is the more difficult road. But the narrow road is the one that leads to eternal life. It's good to be home. Is that okay? I feel like home here. Is that okay? Yes. <laughs> Amen. Ah, la liberta, la casa de Dios. It looks like every time I come here, that song, we get to sing it. You know, so it's such a joy. I want to thank Pastors Jeff and Joanna and the entire leadership team here, you know, for the privilege extended to us. And uh, happy Father's Day to all the fathers in the house. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. Amen. I bring greetings from my wife Eunice, our children, Timothy, Lydia, and Elizabeth, who sent their regards this morning. And they were like, well, we will wait till you get back so we can have Father's Day celebration. And uh, so, yes, we, we praise God. You know, when, when uh, Pastor was talking about the one with six kids and nine and ten, I thought, Maybe we should do the ones with, how many spiritual children do you have, you know? <laughs> That's going to be tough to count. But listen, if you are here this morning as a man, as a woman, and you've got no spiritual kids, this should be the last time you come to God's house and they say, where are your sons and daughters? Say, I have none. Because the grace of God at work in your life, in my life, is able to touch others and draw them into the very kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So thank you. Thank you again, you know, just for granting us such an honor. And good to meet you again, John. Congratulations for being the honored father in the house. You know, in Africa, it is age that speaks. You know, the aged man, we don't mess around them. So all honors to you, John. It's not by accident. It's by the grace of God. You know, somebody was asked, Hey, pastor was preaching and asked, uh, anybody here with no enemies? And a gentleman stood up. And uh, pastor goes, hmm, I didn't expect anybody to say they had no enemies. So asked the brother to come forward. Brother was 93. And pastor said, brother, what's your secret? He said, I outlived all of them. <laughs> when some of them have gone, or most of them have gone, <laughs> you know, you don't go looking for others. But again, it's such a joy. Uh, we just got back on Wednesday, my wife and uh, three children, uh, from an amazing time of service in Cameroon, in West Africa, West Central Africa, and it was wonderful. I'm aware that we have a number of friends joining us through the uh, internet this morning. So those of you joining us from Africa, from Europe, uh, um, you know, when Pastor shared the, uh, the, um, the flyer for this service this morning and and Joe sent it my way. We pushed it out. And so, you know, this is a truly international service going on. And we praise God. We praise God. Hallelujah. Yes. Glory to God. Glory to God. I don't know about you, but if you didn't come with a pen and paper, I would, be, uh, I would encourage you the next time you come to God's house, come with pen and paper. You know, I know we have this stuff online and people can always go back and watch. Um, but I remember as an undergraduate student, uh, one of my professors who had studied in Russia uh, shared with us a one-liner that was very famous, uh, popular at the time. He said, the, uh, the faintest ink is brighter than the smartest memory. Uh, and speaking of one-liners, isn't that what fathers are most popular for, right? So I want you to think for a moment because together we're going to shout out our favorite one-liner, okay? Uh, you may have gotten it from dad, you may have gotten it from an uncle, or what have you. Um, you know, it may well be something of the sort that we will cross that bridge, hello, when we get to it. Uh, so what is your favorite one-liner that you remember from dad, or it may be from mom? Are you ready? On three, we're all going to shout them out. Go, one, two, three. Ah. <laughs> there was that one about a fool for once, is a fool forever, is that it? Uh, a fool at 40 is a fool forever. Oh, my goodness. I'm going to steal that one. Well, this morning we celebrate fathers. We celebrate fathers. We thank God for the gift of fathers. And we don't do this at the expense of our mothers. So, dear mothers, wives, sisters, we celebrate you. You know, because there will be no fathers if there were no mothers. And uh, uh, Amen. <laughs> 
Amen. 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 So I'd like to share this morning um, on the subject of in search or the search for godly fathers. The search for godly fathers. You know, brothers and sisters, family of God, it's an amazing thing to be blessed, to be created in the image of God as a man. It's a difficult thing to be a father. It's a far more difficult thing to be a good father. And it is almost an impossible thing to be a godly father. So you might say, Brother Julius, why do you come talking to us about something impossible? Well, because we read in Luke 1 and 37 that that which may seem impossible to man is actually in the realm of divine possibility. I hope, therefore, this morning is that your heart, my heart, will be stirred up to rise up to be godly fathers, godly men. Our nation needs us. Our communities need us. Our homes, our families need us. And as we engage this morning, the reference, the text I will be working out of is from Proverbs chapter 24, verses 3 and 4. It says, through wisdom, a house is built. Through wisdom, a house is built. And by understanding, the house is established. By knowledge, the rooms are filled with all pressures and pleasant riches. You know, this is part of the joy, the beauty, for, for instance, for those who are already fortunate to be grandparents. Because you walk into their homes and, and you may look at a scripture like this and go, oh, okay, by knowledge the rooms are filled with all precious and pleasant, pleasant riches. You say, okay, I can see the grand piano off in the side. I can see uh, the baseball bat. They were, uh, you know, one of the champions on the MLB or NFL. One of you, we have all those paraphernalia. Is that what the wise man is saying? No. No. As important, as significant as those accomplishments are, the wise man is looking at something richer, deeper, far more enduring. And friends, this morning as we assemble, we assemble at a critical time in the life of our nation, in the life of the nations of the world. In 1966, according to 1996, pardon me, the Department of Health and Human Services put out a staggering statistic. 42% of single mother households lived below the poverty line, 42%. By comparison, 8% of households in which there were married couples, father and mother, these ones, only 8% were below the poverty line. In other words, one in five kids who were below poverty line came from homes by comparison versus those homes with fathers in the house versus those without fathers in the house. And we just heard about the ministry starting in the jailhouse. And you go down there and the numbers are just staggering. In 2001, the U.S. Census Bureau noted that homes in which there were no fathers were almost four times more likely to be poor. And that same 2001 tells us from U.S. Census Bureau, 12% of children in married couple families were living in poor poverty. 12% compared to 44% of children in mother-only homes. And when you look at drug use and alcohol use and physical and emotional health challenges, or for that matter, every major social indicator, the data tells us where there are no fathers, tragedy and anxiety and stress are at an all-time peak. You know, I pulled up a, a, a little graph here this morning that we may have on the screen. Uh, not to bother you too much with a lot of statistics, but if you can catch your eyes in red, you see the homes with fathers in. And in blue, it's single mothers that are raising their families. And I just want to pause here in case you're a single mother and say, Brother Julius, I, I feel really offended. I, I, I don't come to offend you. I am one who was raised by a single mother. And I stand here to applaud every woman graced by God to raise dynamic men and women for a society so desperately in need of experiencing the righteousness of God. It is none of your fault. It's none of your making. Like my mother said, life handed me lemons and I had a choice. I could be bitter as a consequence of the lemons or I could be better by generating, producing lemonade for the rest of humanity. And she raised three sons. I'm the middle one and to the glory of God, 
Here we are, as it were, serving the Lord. I have a brother who works for the United Nations. My younger brother is a civil engineer. The other is an economist. And this one, God alone knows what he is. You know, but I want to say that you can by the grace of God. You can by the grace of God. When you allow the difference for us was mom always told us, God gave you a father, the world stole him from you. And she said, I will do the best as long as God allows me to raise you all up. So if you're here this morning as a single mother, I don't want you for a second to think, oh, gee, this is a disaster. I'm just setting this world up to be, you know, bombarded with these children that come from my home with all these crazy statistics. No. What we're saying really is that the grace of God continues to work amazing things in the hearts and lives of men and women as we all look to him in faith and as we all trust in him. It is still to be said, though, that fatherlessness is a pandemic with disastrous consequences. The data is very clear on that. Fatherlessness, brothers and sisters, Church of God, presents us with an opportunity with unrivaled benefits. How is that even possible? Well, follow me along this morning. Because the fact that maybe like me or maybe like another in this place, you did not have a father, is not an excuse for you to be a derelict father. You know, we have a choice when it comes to being fathers. We don't have a choice when it comes to being men. We're created that way by God with his own purposes in mind. But the moment you and I begin to bring forth sons and daughters, be this biological or spiritual, we have only one of three choices. We can either be an indifferent father, we can be a bad father, or we can be a good godly father. And the challenge to us today is to be godly fathers. Amen? Because that's really what makes the difference. That's what tips the scale. And I do want to note that in the heart of every father, there are three fundamental questions. You may drill down to the heart of a man, of a father, and ask, what are really, what's really going on within you? I think, having been myself a father for the last 16 years now, married for the last 20 years, there are really just three questions fathers are concerned about. How will I live? How will I live? What will my life show? Those who are watching me, what will they see? What will they take away from my life? And finally and most significantly, what will I leave behind? What would I leave behind? And these three fundamental questions come together in three piercing priorities for fathers. Priority number one, what will I provide for my family? What will I provide? Ask any man, ask any father. At the end of the day, it's not so much about the games or the activities or the cars or the job. It's really these three deep piercing questions. What will I provide? Or if you care, how? will I provide for my family? But in addition to that, how will I protect my family? Every father longs to be sure that their family is kept safe. You know, folks might say, <laughs> Pastor Jeff is a really cool, nice man. You want to see the other side with him, try to mess up with Pastor Joanna. You know, you, you will see the other side of Pastor Jeff. You go, brother, I didn't know there was fire in you. That is it. That's a burning longing. Are we in the spirit, Brother Jeff? Amen. He gives me a thumbs up. <laughs> yes. How will I protect my family? How will I shelter them? How will I make sure they are safe? And finally, brothers, how will I promote my family? How will I promote my family? So I want us to wrestle with these three ideas. The idea of provision, the idea of protection, and the idea of promotion. Billy Graham, the famous evangelist, once said, a good father is one of the most unsung, unpraised, unnoticed, and yet one of the most viable assets in our society. A good father, unsung, unpraised, unnoticed, and yet one of the most viable. Okay? We all know who the most valuable asset is, right? Brothers, we're not even going to try it. It's the mother's. We are okay to be a valuable asset, but we know our mothers, our wives, our sisters are the most valuable. Try to build a society without mothers, you'll understand. So what does it 
take to be a goodly fa godly father? What does a godly father look like? How do godly fathers live? What do they show and what do they leave behind? Those are the questions we want to answer this morning. What does a godly father look like? What do they show? When you look at them, when you observe them, when you study their lives, when you study their patterns, and what do they long to leave behind? Three thoughts. As we noted in Proverbs 20, 24, 3 and 4, through wisdom a house is built. You know, this house is not just the fruit of some accident. Some guys come, bring me some two by fours, bring me some backboard, and bring me some, you know, some cinder blocks or whatever. And we're just going to mix things up and see whatever comes up. No, no. It is taking the proper effective application of knowledge. That's what wisdom is. That the knowledge that has been acquired about the geographical terrain, about the temperatures, about the climate factors in this area have led those who designed and generated this phenomenal project to put it together in such a way that you and I are comfortable when we come here to worship the Lord. In the same token, our homes are not going to be the result of some accident it will take careful planning. It will take maximal engagement. It will take a non-apologetic approach that says, if there's anything that's going to count for me, and if anything that I want to show this world, and if there's anything I want to leave behind, I want to leave a home that's built on wisdom. And we're told as well, the wise man speaking says, and by understanding... That's a different kind of wisdom altogether. That's the understanding. That's the approach that says, listen, the pieces that make up this home, you know, there's a stuff that goes for the ceiling or for the roof. There's a stuff that goes for the foundation or the floors. There's a stuff that goes for the walls. And we cannot mix them because there's going to be a problem. The stuff in the ceiling, if it's only one floor, we don't need stuff with, that will withstand too much pressure. But the floor needs to be able to withstand a lot of pressure. There's going to be dancing and jumping and screaming and some will be rolling down doing catwheels. And we want to make sure things are really studied. It does take understanding, friends. And as well, it takes knowledge to fill up the rooms. Psalm 127 verse 4 tells us, like arrows in the hands of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Or if you care, so are the children of a father. Happy is the man, happy is the father who has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, this man who walks with wisdom and understanding and who applies knowledge will not be ashamed. Their children as well will not be ashamed, but they shall speak with their enemies in the gate. Hallelujah. You see, it is God's design that each one of us by his grace as he supplies will have these quivers, these arrows. And like one famous preacher notes, those arrows are not meant as decorations. They are meant to be shot. And the responsibility then of every father is to shoot straight. Because when daddy shoots straight, the children hit the target. When father shoots straight, the children hit the target. And so we're wondering as we wrestle this morning about the questions that burden the hearts of fathers. First of all, we want to note, brothers and sisters, that godly fathers exemplify abiding love. Godly fathers exemplify abiding love. There are those who would look at our children, perhaps they're their teachers, perhaps they're their playmates, perhaps they're their coaches, and they might say, not going anywhere. Oh, but there is one that's constantly, relentlessly, passionately pouring into the lives of their children. Where do we learn that from? We learn that from our Father, Almighty God, the great creator. The one who alone is the embodiment of all there is in terms of perfection, of fatherhood. Lamentations 3 and 23 and 24 tells us about his faithfulness, his compassions, his mercies. Brothers and sisters, the book says they are new when every morning. Every morning. And the psalmist begins to tell us about, you know, praise the Lord, declare, bless the Lord, declare his goodness. Why? For his mercies endure forever. You know, when I got married and we had our first son, Timothy, I'm so thankful for fathers that God blessed me with. 
And one of them pulled me aside and said, you will have no greater responsibility towards this child and their siblings that are coming than to show them what the heart of God looks like. You will have no greater responsibility. You can buy them anything. You can take them anywhere. But if you fail to show them as a father what the heart of God looks like, you would have failed totally. And so I got into the scriptures to say, what does the heart of God look like? And primarily, how do you define love? The shortest definition is God. First John 4 tells us God is love. He is the embodiment of love. There's no way you can explain love away from God. And the greatest responsibility we carry as godly fathers is to demonstrate to our children, demonstrate to our spouses the unconditional abiding love of God. Now, if by now you go, Brother Julius, I agree with you, this is impossible stuff. We are in the same league. Because how does an infallible, per imperfect human being capture the love of God? Well, look at Psalm 103 and verse 3. Point number one, I want to note that such love is gentle and compassionate. The love of God, the love that the Father would have us show to our homes, to our families, to our communities, is love that is gentle and compassionate. Psalm 103 verse 3 says, as a father shows compassion to his children, not if, but as. As. Brothers, we have no option but to show compassionate care to our children. He says, as a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. So, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear them. Another translation says, as a father pities his children, looks at them that they are weak and they are ill-informed and ill-equipped and ill-prepared and not sufficiently aware. And so pours his heart, regardless of the mess they are throwing at them, regardless of the rejection they are throwing at them, regardless of the results they are bringing home. As a father does that, so God pours out his abundant grace, his abundant love, his abundant mercies, and washes over us, regardless of where we have been, regardless of what we have said, regardless of how we have treated him, rejected him. Prime example is Peter. How do you travel with a man for three and a half years? And in front of a little girl, teenage girl, you say you don't know the man. But you know, Jesus had every reason, if he was following my counsel, to say, this is ultimate rejection. You don't need two strikes. He got three strikes and he bailed out on all three. But he loved him. He loved him. And I know as I speak this morning, there are fathers here whose hearts are aching. Because you've tried to raise your children a certain way. And you have seen them as it were go maybe a certain direction or make certain choices and you're wondering, this is it. This is the point to draw the line. Brother, be encouraged. There is no point to draw the line for a godly father. As long as God supplies breath in your lungs, remember his love, his mercy, his compassion are new every morning. And tomorrow morning when you wake up, you go, another day to start again. To show my wife, my children, my community the abiding Love of God. But it's not only that aspect that the father goes to it with gentleness and compassion. There is an aspect that's captured in Proverbs 3, 11 and 12. He says, my son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof. For the Lord reproves him whom he loves as a father, the son in whom he delights. As a father, the son in whom he delights. I want to note that point number two here in terms of the father exemplifying abiding love. One of the most loving acts we as fathers show to our families, to our children, is to instill discipline. Uh oh, I know that D word is not particularly popular in this Asian time in certain quarters. But you know, <laughs> there's a French saying, ce qui aime bien châtie bien. Namely, that we, as it were, offer a little more dose of discipline towards those that we actually love deeper and richer. Romans 12, uh, Hebrews 12, pardon me, makes it clear that it's only the bastards that don't get disciplined. You know, you're driving down the highway and you see a child behaving a certain way, a young man or a young lady, and you look and say, that's not mine. The officers will take care of that. You drive by. But you're driving down the highway and you see your own. <laughs> well, they may as well come and pick you up with him, but you've got some business to deal with there. 
and how you do it is a graceful act. I do want to note that one of the most graceful acts that a father can exercise in demonstrating the love of God to their children is to instill discipline. Oh, don't get me wrong. This discipline doesn't necessarily include the weep, but it need not exclude the weep. And for that matter, you know, if you begin with the weep and you think, you know, like some said, uh, in the beginning was the weep and the weep was with God and the weep was God. So I'm going to just use, that point comes when the weep can no longer be used. It can't, it, it doesn't work. I mean, imagine John trying to weep Jeff this morning. Come on. It's not going to work. It's like, are you okay, brother John? <laughs> you know? So, so the discipline is all encompassing. It is bigger than just one aspect, but includes many aspects. And, of course, the American uh, Pediatric Association, for instance, is very clear. You know, several parents nowadays think that the most beautiful thing there is in the house is the idiotizing box. Some call it a television. I call it the idiotizing box. You know, the most useful part of it is the button that turns it off or the remote. Why? Because there are many scientific reasons and there are developmental reasons why children of a certain age cannot be exposed, should not be exposed to the rapid motion of those images that are going at a pace faster than their brains are developing. A wise father will draw that line and will understand that this is how you place the right boundaries. You see, we're here this morning nice and cool because there are walls. Imagine that this structure had no roof, no walls. None of us will be here. It will be too hot. 110 or 105 degrees would say, thank you, pastor. We'll see you another time. We're going somewhere where we can feel cool and nice. That's how our home's got to be. There's got to be some walls. There's got to be some stairs that take us up. There's got to be some principles under which we operate. And the godly father will understand. I have a responsibility here to instill discipline. But how do I? By modeling it. By modeling it. By showing it. You know, discipline in my own speech, discipline in my own conduct, discipline in my drinking and my eating. And that's how my children realize it's not because the, the refrigerator is full of, chick, uh, you know, Chick-fil-A. Yeah, the kids love Chick-fil-A. And there are all kinds of things. There are chocolate chip cookies. Any chocolate chip cookies people here? Those of you who don't know what this is, don't worry. You live in another planet. You know, macadamia nuts. The ones with macadamia nuts. Brother, this thing, amazing stuff. But you know, you got, you, got, you got five fingers, right? You go, okay, one per finger, one per another finger, one per toe. No, the children don't learn discipline that way. They need to see us exemplify restraint. And that restraint comes when we hear a neighbor who shoots a dangerous arrow our way and we invoke Proverbs 15 and 1, which declares to us a gentle word <laughs> turns away strife. And our children look at us, respond to that, and go, Dad, you got a .37 caliber upstairs. You could just do business in no sun. Some, some mountains are not worth dying on. Like what? Some mountains? Yeah, it's not every mountain you should die on. So a godly father will instill discipline. A godly father will teach sound principles. Will teach sound principles. Proverbs 22 and 6, train up a child in the way he should go. When he is old, he will not depart. What are we saying? And when a godly father looks at the aspect of his life that involves what, how do I live? Their focus is on exemplifying abiding love. Remember the three Ps? There's the aspect of provision. There's the aspect of protection. There's the aspect of promotion. And we have just dealt here with the aspect of provision. What they feed their family is abiding love. Now let's think about this just for a moment. You know, anybody can give your family food. Anybody. But only you as a father can communicate the abiding love of God your family. I want you to think about that. My family may be poor, may not have food. Social services will step in. At least in America, we have such opportunities. Not so all over the world. And at a certain point in our own growth as a couple, Eunice and I had to draw the line. You know, there are things that a family can outsource, and there are things that a family should never outsource. Somebody can do your laundry. That's fine. 
You can pay them a few quarters here or a few bills here. They may do your laundry. Somebody may help clean your house if necessary. But nobody has the capacity to communicate love like you do. And to outsource that becomes a recipe for huge disaster. Let me just say to those of us fathers who are privileged to have daughters in our homes. I have two. Please don't be too busy to give them a hug every day. Don't be too busy to tell them every day you are beautiful. You know why? Because many of our girls, many of our daughters end up in, an ink, in a crazy spin the first time somebody tells them you're beautiful. And that may be a son of the devil telling them. And it means so much to them because daddy never said it. Daddy never told me I was beautiful. Pick them up. Dance with them. Give them hugs, perks, and let them know you are beautiful. I know you've been doing that. Do it some more. Do it every day. You know, do it every day. And, oh, they probably don't have eyes to see yet. They need to hear you telling mommy that. You're beautiful. You're my princess. My heart still beats a little faster every time I see you walking down the stairs. Communicate that. And the children begin to hear that. And one of the amazing sights in our homes, and I bet many fathers here have seen it. If you haven't seen it, today is an opportunity. When you get home with mom, yeah, you've been married 25 years, Brother Julius. We've been in this so long. What are you talking about? Perhaps just in the sight or not of the kids. Give her a hug, give her a kiss. Watch what happens in the lives of your children. They just feel a warmth. They just feel a sense of security. How does a godly father provide for his family? He provides that love, that affirmation, that care, that gentleness, that discipline. Those principles that endure for all time. Yeah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yes, some fathers will provide cars. Some fathers will provide money. Some pro fathers will provide vacations. That's not a sin. That's not a problem. But if you provide all of those and don't provide this, you might be a good father, not a godly father. A godly father will begin here and then move to these aspects. Number two, godly fathers evidence enduring loyalty. They exemplify abiding love. That's how they provide for their families but how do they protect their families? They protect their families by evidencing enduring loyalty. Again, Proverbs 24 tells us, through wisdom a house is built. If you set the foundation of the home in love, you raise the walls in loyalty. Set the foundation in love. Let your home be the place every kid longs to go to. Your own children. Like the prodigals, they know it is a lot better. It's far better at home. And I know it doesn't matter what time I get there. It doesn't matter how I get there. Stinky, smelly, whatever form I come. I know dad is going to come my way. I know mom is going to come my way. I know the community, abundant grace is going to come my way. Let our children know they are never too far away from home. You know, 2 Samuel, 1 Samuel 12, pardon me, 2 Samuel 12 has this amazing story of the woman who sort of, quote-unquote, tricks David into bringing his banished son back home. And in verse 34 of 2 Samuel 12, he said, there is this one who doesn't allow the banished to remain estranged for all time. If you've ruled out a son or a daughter, I pray that the Holy Spirit will soften your heart today, brother, sister, that you will say, God doesn't have an outcast. As long as there's breath in their lungs, there's an opportunity for them to come to light, to come to truth, to come to grace. And I want to be that channel. Godly fathers evidence enduring loyalty. How do they do this? Well, you see, you've set the foundation on love. But if you don't raise walls, marauding animals and insects and all kinds of wild beasts are going to find their way into your home. And the first thing a godly father does is refrain from immorality. Refrain from immorality. Nothing rocks a family and wrecks it like immorality. Oh, Brother Julius, I'm very faithful to my wife. I have occasional dealings with porn at the side. No, brother. No, brother. No. Because what you're doing is you're creating spaces on the walls. And they're going to come in. 
You're creating openings. The window was for air. It wasn't for other things. But now you're cutting off entire pieces of, of backboard or, or, you know, drywall and, and going forth, breaking the cinder blocks that are supposed to be erected there for protection of your family. And you're saying, no, you can come in. Proverbs chapter 5, an entire chapter is devoted. You remember our one-liners? There are a bunch of them in the book of Proverbs. Proverbs 5 warns the son. The father is talking to the son and says, <laughs> you know, there's this woman down the street called the wayward woman. Her lips drip with honey. And, and her bed is, is a cave, as it were. It's, 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 it's a graveyard, as it were. You will have no business with her. But our sons, our daughters, will not hear that from what we say. They will hear that from what we push out. What we push out. Godly fathers protect their families by evidencing loyalty. They refrain from immorality of all forms. Of all forms. I understand we have younger ones here and there's no need for me to go any deeper. But secondly, they refrain from idolatry. You think immorality is bad? Try idolatry. And incidentally, immorality and idolatry often go together tandem. Because really when a man begins to chase after ungodly opportunities for sex and for fulfilling their cravings, what they are really doing is they are allowing space in their hearts for someone else than Jesus. That's why a godly father will understand. I'm going to raise a wall here. That wall says I'm refraining from immorality. This wall says I'm refraining from idolatry. I will have no other God but Yahweh. A godly father will speak like Joshua of old. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. We will serve the Lord. A godly father refrains from immorality. Brother Julius, you don't know the temptations I face. I don't, and you don't know mine, but I have a verse for you, 1 Corinthians 10 and 13. No temptation has come away, except that which is common unto all men. And God, in his wisdom, in his abundant grace, goodness, and provision, will not fail to show a way out. To show a way out. So you see, those disciplines we're talking about, when we say instill discipline, we're not first of all talking about those we will discipline, we're talking about ourselves. That there are certain lines. If you're like me, often on the road, whether ministering or professional meetings or what have you, there, are, there have to be some protocols. There have to be some protocols you follow. And some things that you just realize, this, this line we don't cross. And for any reason, if there's a challenge or an opportunity, this is how. So you set those protocols in place. And then you watch God glorify himself through you. Godly men will refrain from immorality. Godly fathers will refrain, refrain from idolatry because they understand. You see, if you think about our lives as a path, remember we said godly fathers will shoot straight so the children hit the target. You, you pull that archer back, you got an arrow in there, that's your son, that's your daughter, and you're pulling it out to shoot straight. Who's going to hit the target? It's those children. But if you hold that archer in your hand or that bow, whatever it is in your hand, and you allow for yourself a momentary deviation, it starts out here, and by the time you continue it, over time, you're gone off. You're no longer on I-10 or I-66 or whatever highway you prefer. You've taken a tangent and you're going in a completely different direction. And you come years later and say, how did this all happen? The walls have been torn down. Please don't tear down your walls. Godly fathers evidence enduring Loyalty, Lo loyalty to their spouses, loyalty to their children, loyalty to their God. Godly fathers devote their hearts to the Lord daily, not just on Sunday mornings, not just during the worship service and we scream and we shout, wonderful, but daily, every moment, every circumstance, every situation, every arena, Lord, my heart is yours. Build your throne on this heart. They understand when Paul says, don't you know your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? They say, this is where the Holy Spirit dwells. He doesn't dwell on 2110 South McCall Road in Edinburgh, Texas. No, he lives right here with me. Wherever I go, he goes with me. Wherever I stand, he stands with me. So I am totally devoted to him. This is why the wise man says in Proverbs 1, 23, guard your heart with all diligence. 
For out of it are the issues of life. The things that say who you are, they don't flow from what you say, they flow from what's in your heart. That's why David tells us in Psalm 119 and 11, Thy word, O Lord, have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. And as a godly father, you will be wise to have your children memorize the scriptures. Psalm 119, 9 and 11. How shall a young man, young woman, keep his way pure? By taking heed thereto according to your word. How do I keep godly standards around me, the righteousness of God flowing in and through me? By taking my instructions from the word of God, not from the television, not from the pop stars, not from Oprah Winfrey or some other person, but by eyeballing the word of God and said, this is the standard. This is the righteous standard. And brother, this is what we owe our families. This is the kind of loyalty we owe our families. We owe our spouses. We owe our children. And he, God, is able and faithful to help us through. Proverbs 4.23, keep your heart with all diligence. That is akin to a military guard posted outside the residence of a major general. Who knows that if the general is taken down, the entire battle plan is destroyed. You know, when there is war, if the enemy doesn't quite care for the infantry and the guys in the battalion. They go for the big guys, the architects of the battle. Your heart is the headquarters of God's battle plan for your home, for your family. And he says, post a guard right there. Don't let anything come in because if it comes in before you know it, it pollutes the family. So in our loyalty, friends, we evidence, as it were, that which only the Lord produces, enduring loyalty. Godly fathers, we've noted point number one as far as their protection of their families or their provision for their families is concerned. What they do is they exemplify abiding love. As far as the protection of their families is concerned, what they do, what godly fathers do, is they ensure that they're providing, as it were, an enduring loyalty. So that their children are waking up day and night and they're knowing, dad is here for mom. Dad is here for us. And he's here for mom, he's here for us, precisely because first and foremost, he's here for the Lord. They need to see that. They need to see that. Because then they realize... You know, you're not just some crazy man who doesn't have the other tastes and affections and longings of other men, but you're a conquered man. A conquered man who has declared, like Bob Fitz puts in one of his beautiful tunes, I will have no rival throne on my heart. This heart will be enthroned. Jesus alone will sit on the throne of my heart. So the question of protection is addressed through love. They set a foundation of love. The question, uh, as it were, pardon me, of provision, they set a foundation of love. Protection, they set pillars and walls built on loyalty. They know that their word is their bond. That which they've stated, the vows they've made, the commitments they've made to live holy, to live godly. They don't mess with them. But then godly fathers, godly men ask themselves, so what do I promote? How do I promote my family? And everybody wants to be on the papers, wants to be on the news, wants to be heard, wants to be seen. Godly fathers, dear brothers and sisters, endow an incorruptible legacy. Legacy. Three key words. Love, loyalty, legacy. What's our legacy? It's what stays when we're gone. That's what stays. You know, we may have... We may make a few impressions here and there. We may make a few bucks here and there. And people may think, oh, amazing guy, amazing lady. But what stays five years after you're gone? Ten years after? Twenty years? Fifty years after? And you just need to pick up the paper or turn on the television. You say, you, you want us to turn on the television? You may as well. And you will see people who are rising like stars and rockets. And the instant they're gone, it's a trail of disaster that comes following. It's a trail of shame and ridicule and, and just, just amazing defeat. And you're wondering, how was all of this possible? How did they set the foundation? How did they build the walls? And now we're talking about the roof. We're talking about that which provides shelter. Because the promotion of our families ensures that there's a legacy, there's a future that's blazed out for our families, for our spouses, for our children. And we find here that part of the keys to ensuring an incorruptible legacy is to begin early with the end in mind.
begin early with the end in mind. You know, you don't have to be 90 years to think about your legacy. Perhaps it's already too late. Or for that matter, as financial engineers, financial planners would tell us, you don't have to be 50 to start thinking about your retirement. Okay, there's not a man in this room 40 and above who has not thought about their retirement. But let me say this to us brothers and sisters. Have you thought about your legacy? How would you be remembered? One of the hymn writers tells us, fading away like the stars in the morning. Soon will be swept away, only remembered by what we have done. How would you be remembered? Would you be remembered like some famous preacher who shook the world for Jesus? And four months after he was dead, the entire internet was cleaned out of his material because he was found to be not what he presented. Painful story. Would you be remembered as a famous billionaire who really graciously blessed his families with all the good fortunes and Two weeks after he was gone, IRS came with a death bill and this or that bill and this or that tax and the possessions were wiped away. Or would you be remembered as a man, as a woman, as a father, as a mother who left an incorruptible legacy? There are only two. Two that will survive every storm, every tornado, every hurricane, every disaster. Two, the word of God and the souls of men. Godly fathers will therefore make their investments right there to ensure that more and more people receive the word of God and that more and more lives are transformed by the grace and goodness of God. How do they do that? They begin early. Jesus, very early in his ministry, very early in his ministry, Mark, Matthew 6 and 33 says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God. And that wasn't like, okay, begin today seeking. No. Let your life's pursuit be the quest for the kingdom of God. Let the passion of your life be the quest, the desire, the longing to see the kingdom of God come wherever you find yourself. It says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things, wealth, money, houses, education, whatever you are aspiring after, <laughs> you get those as bonuses. But if you go after those, you may not as well get them. And if you get them, the rats... And the climate and the weather and the IRS will be sure to dispossess you of them. Oh yeah, the IRS does some of that, you know. But you start early with the end in mind. You progress steadily with the end in sight. This is a story of St. Paul. He's in the midst of an exciting, amazing ministry time in Ephesus, speaking to the elders and the leaders. And he says in Acts 20, 24, but I do not count my life of any value. Brother Paul, are you okay in your mind? Yes, there's a reason. Watch this. He says, nor as precious to myself. Why? If I may finish my course and the ministry I've received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Paul said, my own life doesn't mean much to me. My own accomplishments don't mean much to me. Why? There's an end in sight. And I want to give full testimony. I want to give full manifestation, full glory to the gospel that has been entrusted to me. Gospel there simply meaning good news. Good news. I don't count my own titles of anything. I don't count my own reputation of anything. If only I will finish. He kept on steadily and he reminds the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 9, 24 to 27. It's not everyone who joins the race that gets an award. It's not everyone who participates that gets a medal. Only those who go by the rules and they go to the finish line. And this morning, by the grace of God, I believe there's an anointing here to strengthen us, brothers and sisters, to go to the finish line. Hallelujah. To go to the finish line. To go to the finish line. Let it not be said there was this brother at Abundant Grace Community Church who started well. Who ran so well but did not finish well. No. Let it be said that the men of Abundant Grace Community Church. There's just something about them. They want to finish well. Come and see them run with passion. Come and see them run with zeal. Come and see them servicing their homes and their families. Come and see them erecting walls and laying down foundations in love. Raising walls in loyalty. And they're committed to finishing well to leave a profound legacy for those behind them. 
You know, we're here this morning precisely, you know, Pastor Joanna referenced, and I thank God your dad is joining us. We're here because he ran well. He ran well. He ran so well. You know, he ran well. And, and the way you know, like somebody I was speaking with, uh, with one of the kings in Africa recently who told me, said, is there a greater business on the planet than Jesus' business? It's been 2,000 years, and his business model just keeps going on and keeps touching every corner of the globe, and he's not even here. How is that possible? He ran well. He ran well. He ran well. He ran well. Hallelujah. So we begin early by keeping the end in mind. We progress steadily by keeping the end in sight, and we prioritize finishing well. You must decide today, I will finish well. You must commit yourself today as a godly father. I will finish well. My name will not be included in the statistics of men who started well, who ran well, but did not finish well. I will finish well. 2 Timothy chapter 4, 7 to 8 tells us, Paul is speaking, says, what have I done? <laughs> I have run the race. I have kept the faith. Oh, and I have finished it. Now, therefore, there's laid up for me crown of righteousness. But it's not just for me, for the brothers and sisters at Abundant Grace Community Church who are also running well, who are keeping the faith and who are enduring because we know beyond all of this, our Father reserves amazing treats for us. Ken Boa has put together a list of seven items as I close this morning. Seven things that will help us finish well. Seven. And I love this list. I'll just give it to you. Number one, intimacy with Christ. Some confuse church membership with intimacy with Christ. God has no greater priority for you and I than that we'll be intimate with him. That will be, we will know him and he will know us. This is what Paul tells us in Philippians 3, 10 to 12. His sight, eyes is set on knowing Christ, that I will know him and the power of his resur resurrection. I want to have that kind of intimate connection. But there's also the fidelity in the spiritual disciplines, faithfulness in the spiritual disciplines. Thirdly, a biblical perspective on life's circumstances. You know, when the hurricane comes your way, how do you process it? When you get a set of trips driving your home, how do you process that joy? Uh, when you get a sudden promotion or maybe you get a pink slip, how do you process all of those? Do you process those in the feelings arena, in the carnal arena, in the worldly arena, or you process in the light of God's word? Number four, a teachable, responsive, humble, and obedient spirit. And that is why one of the strong indicators of men who will finish well, brothers, hear me well, those men are in church. They're in the house of God. They don't suddenly become so, so rich and so famous and so powerful that on Sunday morning they go, <laughs> I used to go to 2110 South McCall, but you know, this morning we're headed for the beach. No. They're in the house of God. They don't forsake the assembling of God's people together as the manner of some is. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Wherever they find themselves, they wake up early and they say, kiddos, it's Sunday morning. We're going to the house of the Lord. And they remind them, I was glad when they said unto me, come let us go in the house of the Lord. Hallelujah. Those who finish well, number five, carry with them a clear sense of personal purpose and calling. I hope you know God has called you. Your calling may be limited to McAllen, Texas or to Edinburgh, Texas. It may be limited to South Texas, but whatever it is, however it is, God's hand is upon our lives. And let's never lose sight of that. Whatever comes our way, comes our way to strengthen us, to energize us, to empower us, to keep on in that path of his calling. And those who finish well, keep around them healthy relationships. They keep healthy relationships with resourceful people. You know, we're not called to go it alone. We need one another. We need one another. We need one another. We need one another. And, and as, as clear as that sounds, Perhaps so difficult it is for us men in particular. When this meeting breaks out, guess who's likely to stay here to be the last? It will be the women. Because they're going to chit-chat and tell one little story. The brothers will just go, hi, bye. We're gone. Out. 
But we need one another. We need around us relationships that resource us, that strengthen us. You know, this morning, one of my fathers wrote to me and was telling me about the trip we just had with the family. We went into some restive area of the globe. And he said to me, for you to undertake that journey was a mark of faith. For you to actually execute the journey and come back without anyone being hurt is a demonstration of leadership, and I commend you for that. You know, that made me feel good, that an older man was speaking into my life, resourcing me, reminding me, you could only do this by the grace of God. You could only do this as a result of his calling and of his assignment. We all need such people in our lives, people who look down and they speak, and people that we look up to and they encourage us. And finally, we all need, as it were, to finish well, ongoing ministry involved investments in the lives of others. You might say, Brother Julius, I had three children. They're all grown. They've left the house. Well, welcome to ministry time. Because, you know, in South Texas today, there are young boys and girls who are wondering what the future holds. And they need a father to speak into their lives. I told you how I was raised. But, you know, God in his mercy surrounded me with men. I don't have the time to begin to call their names and tell their stories. Men who just saw there was potential here. And they they said, yeah, we have children. In fact, all of my mentors, all of my spiritual mentors have large families of their own that will keep them busy every day of their lives. But they turned right around, made space for one. Made space for one, and they pulled me in, and they began speaking into my life, nurturing my life, blessing my life, encouraging me. And I do want to say today, you may say, Brother Julius, I'm retired. Praise God. That means you have a lot of time in your hands to prepare the next generation. You have a lot of experience under your belt to equip the next generation. All glory and honor to our God and his Christ who is out there looking for godly fathers, godly men, godly mothers, godly women, and I pray that he finds us. What have we been saying? Number one, the godly fathers make sure they provide for their families to lay a solid foundation of abiding love, not if love. If your grades are good, I love you. If you come home without wrecking the car, I love you. No, no, no. Their love is abiding. Doesn't care how you stink, how you feel, how you've showered or not showered. They just love you because guess what? They love you. It's unconditional. That love should not be taken for granted, but that's their posture of heart. They lay down those foundations in love. They raise the pillars in loyalty. They will not allow mosquitoes, nor would they allow rabbits or monkeys or, or, you know, elephants, lions. Big, small, they don't allow them because they keep their heart focused on the Lord. They keep their family anchored in the Lord. That's how they raise the walls. And when they think, how do I promote this family? How do I keep this family name going? They're thinking of their legacy. And they're saying, oh God, I want to finish well. I want to finish well. I don't know at what stage you are in the race. I don't know at what point you are. But brothers and sisters, we're all called to stay evidencing the love of God. Exemplifying, as it were, his goodness to a hurting world. And then promoting the advance of his kingdom as we allow room for others to come. You know, when we get to heaven, that table is too big. There's from one end to the other end. Eye hasn't seen, ear hasn't heard. They're going to come from every tongue, from every tribe, from every race, from every nation, from every land, from every barrier politicians have tried to erect. They will come in from the Iron Curtain, from the capitalist arena, from the communists. They will all come in because the blood of Jesus is still efficacious and powerful. And perhaps you're here this morning and say, preacher, I don't know this Jesus. How do I even begin? You begin very simple by admit. You're a sinner. The only thing that stands between you and him is your sin. He already paid the debt in full, and you just say, I give you my sins. I surrender to you. Whether on live television or on the internet, today or later on, as you watch this, you have an opportunity right where you are to say, Jesus, I repent of my sins. I welcome you into my heart. And I want to live a life that counts for you, for your glory, for your honor. I can see the devastation. There was no foundation. I can see the disaster. There were no walls. I can see there is no future. But today, I come, I surrender to you. And I believe your love flowing in my heart 
heart and I believe the loyalty, my heart will be totally yielded to you for you have declared there's no greater commandment than this, than to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. So this is my commitment, Lord. Father, you know where I've been with my wife. You know where I've been with my children. You know I have been that bad father. You know I've been that father who is not an example, but I come to you for grace. And brothers and sisters, today, right here at Abundant Grace Community Church, not a name by accident, but a name by prophecy, Abundant Grace is available. Abundant Grace is available to all who would say, Father, help me. I want to be this godly father. I want to be a father who pushes out abiding love. I want to be a father who pushes out, as it were, an enduring loyalty, an enduring testimony. I want to be a father who finishes well and who brings my family to a glorious finish in your holy presence. I want to be that kind of father. He will do that for you. He will do that for us. And this is my prayer for us, that he will indeed glorify himself in this house and beyond. In Jesus' name. Thank you so much.